That song, after having a cold all week, was not the one I should have started with today. (sighs) Adrian, did I? Yes? All right. Really miss Jared for this computer stuff. Worthy of every song we could ever see. Yeah, it's a firm foundation. 
nation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes and wonder and show I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken and I will build my life upon your love it is a firm foundation and I will put my trust in you alone and I will not be shaken beautiful song Jesus. 
Father, we just thank you, God, for everything that you have done in our lives, for everything that you are doing in our lives, Father. We can only just imagine, and even imagining will never be good enough to, to be able to comprehend all the things that you have done for us and all the things that you are doing. We can only imagine, uh, God, the things that you went through to bring us to this point, Father. We can only imagine the amount of hurt uh, that you had to bear, uh, God, as you sent your son to die on the cross for our sins, God. Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you, God, that we could have been anywhere else, God, but you drew us here. We thank you, God, that, that we realize that we're in the need of a Savior, God, and, and we realize that we're not perfect, that we're not too good uh, to not be in, in your presence. We thank you for this, Father. And, and, God, we just thank you for your message that you'll be speaking to us today. And, God, in everything we do, may it always be to give you glory, honor, and praise. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hey, well, wow. Wow, it is a, it is a full house this Sunday. Um, hey, well, well uh, this morning, yeah, amen. Hey, well, this morning, uh, I just want to go into uh, communion. We're going to be taking this time to go into communion. And uh, for those in the front, the, the elements should have already been handed to you. But for those of you that are not in the front, you want to sit away from the pastor and fear that he'll speak into your life. Um, the elements are right in front of you in, in the bottom of the chair. So um, as we're about to just take part in communion, um, we just ask that you would just prepare your minds and hearts for this as we get ready to pray over the elements. You know it's a good worship service when you don't take the time to open up your elements before you come up here and pray for them. And then you struggle. So, Father, we just thank you for this body, Lord, this body that was broken and, and torn for us, God. We, and, and this body that was beaten so badly beyond recognition so that, you would, so that it would be broken for, for sinners like me. Father, we thank you, God, that, that you would choose that you have so much love in your heart for us that you would just come down to this earth, take on a, a human form, go through human pain, human emotions, God, for sinners like me. And we just thank you, God, for, for this body that was broken. May we always remember the things that you have done for us. Thank you, Lord. In the same way, Father, we thank you for, for this blood that was poured out, God, this blood that that washes over all sins, God. It doesn't matter from what walk of life. It doesn't matter uh, how far gone we feel we are, God. As you, 
As you said to the man on the cross, you said, today you will be with me in paradise, God. May we remember that it is never too late for us to turn to you. Even, even when it seems like the last minute, God, may we realize that there's no, there's no waiting period or, or trial period. We don't have to get our lives right three days before we die or something like that. Because your blood, God, your sacrifice was enough. And your sacrifice covers over all sins, God. We just thank you for this, God. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Father, as we took partook in the bread and, and, and in the wine, God, may we always remember the sacrifice. And may we always remember what it was that you did for us on that day, God. And we just thank you for your body that was broken and your blood that was poured out for sinners like us, God. May we never forget that we're in need of a Savior. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I don't don't know. I'm trying to bring back something that Pastor John would always do. I don't know why he stopped doing it, but hallelujah. 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 Come on, let's get excited. Let's start praising God because, one, we are way different from where we used to be. Wow, this is amazing to just see that there's like almost no empty seats. So just give a hand to God for that. For those of you that have been praying, (laughs) amen. Well, first of all, I just want to dismiss the kids, uh, and if you would just go and follow Matt, Pastor Matt back there and his wife, and, and have kids church, Alejandro, that means you too. My son, he doesn't like to, to go to kids church for some re- reason, he's weird like that, but, <laughs> but hey, I just want to uh, bring up a couple of announcements. First of all, we have Monday night prayer, so if you have any concerns or prayer requests, First of all, we want you to know that we're a church that, that prays and we believe in, in prayer. And right now I have a prayer that's going out uh, to a certain member for her niece. And, and I'm just praying for complete healing. I'm believing God for complete healing in her life. Uh, so if you have any prayer requests or concerns, first of all, we ask that you would fill it out on the card. But we also ask that you would just join us for Monday night prayers uh, in that. And also on Wednesdays, if you have a teen... I'm already thinking of a few right now that are in the service. We just invite you to go out to those Wednesday night uh, services. Uh, Pastor Andre is actually here. He joins us in the beginning of the month um, as he goes around to the four different churches. So if you have any questions, we just ask that you would take this time and use this opportunity to just reach out and talk to him. Uh, he's actually up front right here with his wife. Um, as well, we also have Wednesday night classes on the Book of James. It's really an amazing experience, amazing time. We also ask that you would just take time to join us in that, and uh, you just really get a different perspective on what's going on in the Bible. And I can attest to that. That is a really great class. Um, and also May 13th, um, if you are 30 for the, like, 30th time, this class is for you. And we just ask that you would just come out. Yep, yep, somebody's 30 for the 30th time back there. Hey, we just ask that you would just come out and, and just appreciate what we're doing. Uh, we as pastors, we believe in investing in everybody. It doesn't matter how young or how old. We really want to invest in your lives, so we encourage you to just come out and, and be with us for that. It's at 12 p.m. Um, and also, Mother's Day is coming up. And on Mother's Day, we're doing baby dedication. So if you have any newborns, uh, we don't do the baptism part because we believe that um, – a Christian should be able to profess their faith. They have a knowledge of what's going on. Uh, they come to the belief themselves, and then they get baptized. But you can still dedicate your child. So we encourage you to uh, sign up for that. You can sign up online uh, for the baby dedication if you want your kid dedicated. And with that being said, we're just going to invite Pastor John up. That's we're about to get dive into the Word of God. Thank you. Hey, would you just stand with me and just, we're going to pray, just a couple minutes. Today, I don't know how your day started, but my day has been just a little crazy. <laughs> Walked into the sanctuary today, and uh, our live stream computer refused to work, and so those of them who were watching us online is not watching us on live. And then uh, we try to fix it, and that fixing caused more problems, and so there's quite a bit of issues. So I just want to just spend a couple minutes before we go to the Word, because I just really believe uh, God wants to speak to us. Would you just take a couple minutes, just pray? Just wherever you are, Father, we just thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We just pray that you would take away every distraction from us this morning. Would you just speak to us? Holy Spirit, we pray that you would transform us, Lord Father. We pray that you would prepare our hearts and our minds to be able to hear what you are going to speak into our lives, Jesus. 
We pray, Father, that your transformative power will touch our lives today. In the name of Jesus, Father, I pray if anybody else is here in this room with a lot of distractions and things going wrong this morning in their life, I pray for the healing of God to touch their life. I pray for your peace that surpasses all understanding to touch their life. Lord, I just bring up the different parts of the world, especially India this morning, as many people are dying from COVID. We just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would stretch your hand out upon that nation. And every person who's been affected, families who are being affected, would you just touch that country in the name of Jesus. We are making decisions as we are moving forward. Would you just touch the people in Grafton, the leaders in Cedarburg, the leaders in Port Washington, in Mequon, and in Belgium, Lord Father, in all these different communities. Would you just touch the leaders as they are making decisions, Lord Father. Continue to guide us, lead us in Jesus. I know some of you are coming back because uh, after COVID, and it's really awesome to see Nicole and Mac and Keely. So thank you guys. You guys join us every week online. Your husband is an absolute blessing to us here at this church. Uh, we just love Zach. So so thank you, thank you for being part of this. And uh, I know when Zach had to make the decision. Uh, Nicole was part of it. <laughs> he was like, let me talk to my wife. <laughs> and uh, and uh, she was one of the big reasons why Zach said yes. So, uh, so thank you. Thank you for allowing Zach to be part of this. So, uh, today we're going to wrap up our series, hopefully, on the power of altars. So we are in the uh, third part of the power of the altars and the last two altars we're going to look at today. Uh, the people build an altar. So far, we see one particular person building altar. We're going to wrap up with the people building an altar. So we're going to look in uh, Judges chapter 2, verse 1. Judges chapter 2, verse 1. So it's in the Old Testament. And it's the time when uh, Joshua is sort of wrapping up, and, uh, and the people are towards the end, and the judges are coming in, and, and pretty soon the kings would, uh, would start to come through. So over here, the Bible says this, Judges chapter 2, verse 1 onwards. Then the angel of the Lord came up from Gilgal to Bochim and said, I led you from Egypt and bought you from the land which I sold to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you. You know, it starts off in Gilgal, even though the name of the altar that we're looking at is eventually we're going to see in verse 5. And the Bible, the Bible says, says, and then they named the, the place Bochim and they sacrificed, sacrificed there to the Lord. But to understand this Bokim, we have to go back to verse 1 where it talks about Gilgal. Gilgal is a very important place and very, very significant all the way into the life of Christ. It's a very significant in the spiritual walk of a person. Gilgal is the place where God told the people, hey, you get to inherit your blessing, your promise that I've given you. This is the place where God makes a covenant with the people and he says, hey, this place... I'm going to guide you. I'm going to lead, lead you. I'm going to make a covenant with you. And God makes a promise with the people. So it's a place of new beginnings. So the Bible says, then the angel of the Lord came from Gilgal. That means somewhere all along from Gilgal to Bochim, the angel of the Lord wasn't with them. Somewhere in the new beginnings, when things started going great, they got super excited about God and said, you know what, God, why don't you just hang out back there? We've got this. And they kept moving. So eventually they come to this place where, 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 where it's called Bokim. But in the way, God asked the people a question. God questions the people. In Judges chapter 2, verse 2, the Bible says, You shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of the land. You shall tear down their altars. But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? See, the thing is when things are going great in our life is when we start to slowly move away from God or the things of God. It's when God starts to do certain things in our life and through our lives. At that point, we start to slowly take some steps and be like, you know what, God, I got this. I'm, I'm okay. You know, if you've ever tried to help your kid ride a bicycle or walk, when they start taking a couple steps, they're like, I got this. I got this. And you're like, eh. The moment you take a turn, you're going to fall. It's like you don't know the bicycle's got some turns, so you're going to have to hold the brakes. And there's a lot of stuff that you don't know yet. But the kid is like, I've got this. I got the balance down. And that's how we are. The moment we take a step and we are like, life is going good. And then God's bringing us into these new beginnings in our life. And we are like, you know what, God? 
this is your spot. Just hang out here. We'll build you an altar. You're in Gilgal. Just hang out there. And then all of a sudden, as you keep moving, eventually when God has to come back into your life and speak, and he says this, why have you done this? Why have you sort of abandoned everything I told you, and you're doing just the opposite? God is like, I, I explained to you very clearly, you cannot do this in this land. This promise has all of these things that, that for your benefit you have to follow, but somehow you have not followed any of it, and now you're in a place of Bokim, which we'll look at is, is a place where basically God says, I have to withdraw my protection and my blessing over your life. So in verse 3 onwards, the Bible says, Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns, in your side, and their gods shall be a snare to you. You know, when a, when a people group start to forget the promises that they made with God and the things that God made with them, all of a sudden, everything starts to fall down. Everything starts to get into problem. You know, this past week, I was talking to somebody, and uh, I, was, I was doing something for our church, and we were filling out some paperwork for, for the tax exempt. And the guy was asking me a question. He said, do you know how the tax exam thing came for churches? I was like, no, I don't. So I took time to go back and figure out how did it come back. So the founding fathers of America used Ezra chapter 7, verse 24, as a tax exempt. That was the words they used for giving a tax exempt to the churches. It says, you shall also know that you have no authority to impose taxes on the house of God. So it's like they took a verse and then they went back. And then I looked at all of the things, and it says that, that they've taken over 15,000 documents from the founding fathers, and they've narrowed it down to 3,000 documents, and they said, okay, here's 3,000 most important documents of, of our country, and over 90% of it is old scripture. See, our country was based and founded on Christian values and, and on a covenant that they made with God and said, God, this is America. We are coming here and, and we want to follow you. We want your blessing in our life. We want your guidance in our life. And we want to go forward with you. And somewhere when God has been blessing us and we are the superpower and we have everything, we have somehow, it's, it's, it's a shame to talk about God or to uh, mention the word of God or to say anything about God. And that's what had happened in the life of the Israelites too. See, when, when God guided them for 40 years through all kinds of great miracles and signs and wonders, they were like, this is awesome, God. And then God said, you know what? I'm making a covenant with you because you seem like good people. You seem like we can go to this next level. And somewhere when God started to show all of his miracles and blessings, they figured out that we can go as far as we can and do as whatever we want in our life without God's guidance and God's blessing over our life. Literally, Judges chapter 2 is where we find America today. A group of people who have forgotten that this country was built on the very foundations of the word of God. The three branches of the government was based on Isaiah chapter 33 verse 22. So when they came up with the three branches of the government, they said, this is why we're doing the three branches of the government. It's from Isaiah chapter 20, 33 verse 22. Again and again, when they, when they did different things in the scripture, they went back. They said there were three people who, who influenced the, the, the founding fathers. But more than anything else, the Bible was quoted four times more than one of those guys. 16 times more than Blackstone or Locke. 94% of the quotes of the founding fathers were based on the word of God. 34% of the quotes in the early text are all directly from the scripture. And 60% of them were taken directly from the word of God to arrive to the conclusions that we have the great country of America today. See, the people are building an altar, and this altar they're building is because God has showed up from Gilgal, a place of covenant, and he shows up to them, and he says, hey, here's the thing. At one point, I'm going to have to stop. Because you are not treating me like your God, so I, I can't be your God. So let me stand in the side and you do your thing. See, we realize and see many times only when it's gone. See, the thing is, we don't realize till God has really walked away from, from, from giving his protection or giving his guidance or having his hand over us till he's really walked away. And it's that moment we're like, ah, 
God, he sort of walked away. And the Bible says, And so it was when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to the children of Israel that the people lifted up their voice and wept, and they named the place Bokim because it was a place of tears and a place of crying because they realized that the God who had promised to walk with them had said, You know what? At this point, you seem to know what you're doing. Why don't you just do this on your own? Everything that I promised to do for you, I'm going to have to stand in the side and watch. See, in our life, it's, we, we all have bokeh moments in our life when, when God's guiding us or God is doing something. And then we realize that God's blessing, God's guidance in our life. And somewhere we take it for granted and, and we get to a place and he turn around and God is not there. Because he's at a whole different place. And that's why in verse 1, when I read verse 1, I had to go back to it again and again. It says, then the angel of the Lord came from Gilgal to Bokim. That's a long journey. That the angel of the Lord wasn't with Israel. A, long, a lot of wars had taken place where Israel hadn't had the angel of the Lord with them, guiding them, leading them. Because somewhere when they crossed the river Jordan, they just felt like they accomplished everything. Like, God, this is good. This is good. We got this. Somewhere we feel like we can do church without the real power of the Holy Spirit in and through our lives. Somewhere we feel like if we just do the right elements of a church, it's going to be powerful and effective. But the church is never going to be powerful without the Holy Spirit guiding us and leading us. Without the power of the Word of God in our lives, it's never going to be powerful. Today, if you're in a place in your life where you realize and see, it's like, hey, when I turn around, I feel like, my life is filled with more tears and more problems. And I turn around, I don't see God out there. It's because somewhere, the God who made all these promises in your life, you've sort of left him at the back and you feel like you need the blessings right now. But God says, hey, you know what? You're doing life on your own. My promises are for those who follow what I've said. It's if you listen to what I'm saying. If you make your own changes and make your own, own decisions, then, then God's like, hey, why don't you just live life however you want and, and it's be perfectly fine. God withdraws his protection. I also said, I will not drive them out before you. They will become traps to you. Their gods will become snares. Later on, we'll see the second altar where by the time it's come over there, almost no prophets are left. We're followers of God. No people are left because there's more tears and problems and situations. Today we see in America, we have forgotten. You know, there's a whole generation of people who do not know who God is. The Bible says, you're supposed to share with your children. How many of your kids know that you follow Jesus? That you have a relationship with God? That your relationship and your walk with God means a lot to you and, and it mean, it's going to mean a lot to them. Or do your kids not have any idea of what your values and your structure is in your life? You know, that's what happened. See, the Israelites were, were commanded by God to continue to teach their children and tell them, Hey, this is what our God's done for us. This is what God's done in my life and this is why I follow Jesus. See, many times I have to sit down. Even yesterday, I was sitting down with my son and I was explaining to him why I don't do certain things. I was like, it's because of what God has done in my life. See, you have to speak to your children about why you do certain things different from everybody else. Because somewhere, they're going to forget what God is all about. So today, when you walk to somebody who's 20 or younger and ask them, do you know that the founding fathers of America built this country on the very values of the Bible and scripture? They have no idea. Do you know that the, that the three different segments that they broke down was based on the scripture in Isaiah? They have no idea. They don't think America was built on any kind of Christian values or structure. Do you know the reason America still continues to stay the greatest country in the world is because of the love for God's people. It's because of the support that we send to missions and, and, and overseas and, and the heart that this country continues to have for people who are dying and, and people who are poor and people who are destitute and people who are lost. No other country has this kind of a love for people. No other country gives to causes like America does. This is because it's all from the Bible. The Bible is what makes us that way. 
It's not something that just came up into our life and we are some great people. There's great people in every country. But America is very, very different because of the word of God. I want to encourage you. Take a look in your life at the altar you're standing at. Is it the altar of Bokim? Where you're like, you know, you come to a realization that God, I, I don't know. I don't see you in my life or in my family. What's going on? Have you walked away too far from God? Have you gone to a place in your life where you turn around and God is not very close to you? So when the angel of the Lord spoke these words to all the children of Israel, they lifted their voices up and wept, and they called the place Bochim. See, it was like when I was reading it, I was realizing what a sad moment for God to have to walk and come over. Because they're building an altar and God's coming up to the altar. Because they have left him all the way back. The last time they built an altar was in Gilgal. They built an altar with the 12 stones. And the next time they're building an altar is over here in Bokim. Before they can name it, God already names it Bokim. See, the people name it in verse 5. They call the place Bokim. But before God even shows up, in verse 1, he says, And the angel of the Lord came from Gilgal to Bokim. God already decided what that place is going to be. God already said that place is going to cause a lot of tears in your life. It's going to be a realization of tears and, and sorrow in your life because I've already decided what it's going to be in your life. It's like then you're like you come up with the realization like, oh, God, it's going to be a tearful place. Yeah, I already called it a tearful place. See, God already calls destinations and altars in your life way before you name it. God already names it. That's why it's very important to know who your God is. It's very important to understand what your God is capable of doing. It's very important that you as, as parents and as adults, as grandparents, as leaders, that you continue to teach the younger people about why you do what you do and about the things of God. Because very soon... People will not know. And nobody's to blame. It's not because God is to blame. It's you are to blame when your children don't know about God. It's I am to blame when my children don't know about God. It's not the church. It's not somebody else. It's not my neighbors. It's not the country. It's me. When my children are, are having some struggle, it's me. Because you have to continuously keep telling your kids that God this is what God is about. This is the covenant God made with us. This is who we are. And so that way, they will not have a Bokim moment in their life. Bokim happens when God steps aside. You know, your life is filled with sorrow and pain and hurt in your life. When, when God steps aside, automatically a lot of sorrow and hurt come into your life. See, it's not that in Christianity you don't have hurt and sorrow, but there's always that peace that you find in the midst of that pain, in the midst of the sorrow. See, when Bokim happens, it's where God steps aside. Now you're trying to carry all this weight, all this sorrow, all this pain, all by yourself, and you're trying to figure out, what do I really need to do? And God's like, you just need to just return back to who I am to you. You need to make this journey back. The second altar I want to talk about is Elijah builds an altar. In 1 Kings chapter 18, and we're going to wrap it up with this one. 1 Kings chapter 18. The Bible says this. Elijah builds an altar. It's really awesome where he builds the altar and what he does. This is the last altar we're going to talk about. This altar does not have a name. But it's one of the most powerful altars in the Bible. Elijah builds this altar as a single man with a bunch of other guys who step up. But this altar is attributed to Elijah, who stood in a time when all the people had walked away. The same thing that God says in, in Judges chapter 2. He says, hey, if you don't turn back, you're going to start following these very gods. You're going to be bowing down to these very gods. So later on in, in 1 Kings chapter 18, when you see in chapter 18 verse 21, when Elijah is building that altar, there are more prophets for Baal and Astrod. There are more people serving everything else than they are serving God. There's more altars built to all the other gods and, and all the other temple, all the way up to the leadership. The king himself is a follower of Baal. 
The queen herself is a follower of Baal. The leadership has changed. Everything has changed. And God let them know, hey, this is the journey you're taking. If you want me to step aside, I will. But remember, it's going to be filled with a lot of hurt and pain in your life. And it's going to be just nonstop of all kinds of chaotic mess and, and no protection from my life into yours. And they took that journey. And so later on in 1 Kings chapter 18, the Bible says that Elijah is building a temple, uh, an altar. And he doesn't name the altar for one reason. Before you build an altar, this is what you need to do. And the Bible says this. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 21, Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If God is Lord, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. See, it's the same thing. If you go to people in the road and say, Hey, who do you think is God? They'll never answer who God is. They're like, yeah. I don't want to answer that. That's what the people of Israel did. This is the nation that was had a covenant with God. And, and Elijah is standing in front and he says, hey, who is your God? And they're like, yeah, we don't want to answer that question right now. We don't feel comfortable. Like, what the heck is wrong with you? Like, what kind of nation are you? You know, we don't want to offend anybody right now. It's just, we're still processing what kind of nation we are. Like, what the heck? You're a Christian nation. Go to India and ask them what kind of nation this is. It's a Christian nation. But only we in America are still trying to figure out what kind of nation we are. It's like same like Israel. It's like, so Elijah steps up and he's like, hey, who do you guys want to follow? And they're like, um, we don't want to say anything right now. We just, they're just very quiet. And Elijah's like, hey, who's your God? Because it looks like you're following the world and you have all these altars and you have 400 prophets for this one, one God, but, but nothing. It's just me by myself here for the Lord our God. And they no answer. And he's like, guys, do you remember where you started from? Do you know who you really are? And they're like, we would prefer to stay quiet. We'd like to disagree to agree to disagree. It's like, you know, that's like a famous line that most Americans use. We like to agree to disagree. It's like, what the heck is that? What kind of rubbish is it? <laughs> just, just say I don't accept what you're saying. Fine. It's okay. <laughs> I'm not going to go to the bed and cry. I'll be fine. <laughs> it's like saying stuff. Just, you know, like, just, you know what? Hey, here's the truth. I follow Jesus. Jesus is who is God in my life. This is the truth. There's, there's nothing else. I had a couple of weeks ago... I got done with church here on Sunday, and I was in my house, and at 5.30, I had someone knock on my door, and uh, this guy shows up to my house, and, and he had a bunch of mangoes. He said, Pastor, I saw your picture on the magazine and stuff, and I know you're Asian. I don't want it to be, look racist. I didn't know what you like, so I thought I'll bring mangoes. <laughs> I, said, I said, it's fine. It's fine. I like mangoes. Come on in. <laughs> he's, like, he's like, you don't know me, but... I want to share my life. I, I, I have a couple questions for you. So he came in. I thought he's going to take 10 minutes and he's going to get up and leave. No, he was in my house till almost 10 o'clock at night asking me questions about God. How do you know that Jesus is real? How do you know that the God you serve is real? I just want to know, what is it about your life that's so different that I'm still trying to find in my life? He's like, I don't have the peace that, that you have. How can I find that peace? See, the thing is, you have to know who your God is. If there's ever a question, before you build any kind of altar to God, you need to know, who are you building the altar for? What is the purpose of the altar? So Elijah says, hey, I'm going to build an altar. You guys need to figure out who your God is. Who's your God? Who's side on you? Because when the altar gets built, you're going to know who the real God is. So you need to make a decision. See, before you see the true move of God in your life, you have to get to a place where you say, you know what, this is who God is. This is who I follow in my life. It doesn't matter what happens, what kind of problems come. This is the God that I say is God, and you follow that. So Elijah lets the people know, hey, before we go any further and you realize who God is, I want you to take a moment and realize who God is. How long? Will you waver? Remember who your God is. Elijah does not build a new altar. He just repairs. Sometimes we need to revisit the altars that's broken down. Some of us know God really well. 
But we have all have these altar moments in our life that, that we have just broken it down and it's just in ruins that we need to revisit and say, God, you know what? Would you renew your relationship and your power in my life? Would you renew your, your, your presence in my life? Your covenant in my life? Because somewhere I've walked away from it. You have to understand your God is a promise keeper. Your God is a personal God. Elijah chapter 18 verse 31. Elijah, the Bible says this. Elijah took 12 stones. According, so verse 30 onwards. Elijah said to them, come near to me. So the people came near to him and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. He's not building a new altar. He's not naming the altar. But it's really cool what he does. In verse 31, the Bible says, Elijah took 12 stones. According to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob. See, when you go back in Judges chapter 2, Gilgal is the place they took 12 stones and placed it in a circle. That's why it's known Gilgal. It's, it's a place of 12 stones. It's a place where God gave them a covenant. It's a place where God said, when you're crossing River Jordan at its full flood stage, take the stones because I want you to know that I am the God who can do miracles in your life. And all the way in, in 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, over here, Elijah is taking the 12 stones of the altar that's broken down and he reminds them that, hey, let's go back to the angel of the Lord in Gilgal. The 12 stones are of very, very important value. Our God is a God who made a covenant with us. Our God is a God who has a relationship with us. And then he goes into the second point. And he says, then he built the trench. And he built, the, and then he says, the tribes, according to the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come saying, Israel shall be your name. The Hebrew word is El Israel. El Bethel Israel. I am the God of you. A personal God. He goes back to the altar that Jacob had built. And he says, you know what? I need to remind God and myself that who my God is. He's not only a God who, who has new beginnings. And a God who keeps covenants. But he's also a God who cares about personal relationships. So here he comes back. Builds this altar. But he doesn't name it anything. But the significance of the altar is the altar that was built at Gilgal. And the altar that, that Jacob built. And then he says, you know what? This is a God who keeps his promise. This is a God who's a personal God. And then he put the stones and he built the altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seeds of uh, like two large things of seed. Basically, see us, it means like 17 pounds of grain is what they can put around it. And he put the wood in order, cut the bulls in pieces and laid it on the wood and, and said, fill four Pots of water, it's four barrels of water. And pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And then he said, do it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it three times. Three times, four barrels of water. And on 12 barrels by now, they have poured water all during a drought. Water was absolutely valuable and important to the people at this time. Elijah is like, hey, if you're going to come after God, if you're going to do a sacrifice to God, would you give what is the most important and valuable to you? Would you give what is of absolute scarcity right now to God? You're like, some of us are, are at the altar, but we don't want to give what is super valuable. It's like, ah, I can't give this. Not this God. You know, this is very important. I don't know. So the people had to step out in faith. God had not moved or done anything. See, the other, other prophets, if you go to a couple verses ahead, they had spent all day, all day doing all kinds of stuff. They were like screaming, cutting themselves up, jumping up and down, doing some hula hoops, everything. They were doing all kinds of stuff. They did every trick they could do and screaming, jumping, dancing, turning around. They did all kinds of tricks that they could because their God actually, Baal is the God of thunder and, and water. It's like, it's really sad. Like their God is the God of water. And, and what Israel's having is a drought. They don't have water. It's like the cool part about our God is like, he like messing with people. <laughs> like he's like, okay, that's your God. Fine. Then I'll cut off the water. For three years, they had no water. And they're like, come on. We're worshiping our God with everything we have for three years. And God's like, yeah. Because I am the one who created the water. 
See, God is not the God of what He just, that's just, He's God of everything. It's not one particular thing. See, the people over here had to go to each God for everything. Like, this was the God of, of water and thunder and lightning. And here's God. It's like, yeah, I'm going to shut the heavens down. Just to prove a point. For three years, he's proven a point. And then they show up and they, they're doing a whole sacrifice. And they're doing all kinds of stuff. And Elijah's like, why don't you guys do the altar first? Go ahead. Take, take the first dibs. Do it. I'll just... I'll hang out. And it's all the way till evening. They're like crying out. And the whole time, Elijah, he, he's like a very good friend of mine. He's like saying all kinds of stuff. It's like having a whole commentary going on there. Why don't you try a little louder? I don't think it's loud enough. Why don't you do it a little louder? Like I do it with my kids when they're doing stuff. So I just be messing around with them. And it's like, uh, why don't you try it this way? Why don't you try it that way? Must be sleeping. Must be he took a break somewhere. And it's like he's saying all kinds of stuff to them. And then and, and at no point did their God show up. And the Bible says it's evening now. And Elijah steps up. And he's repairing the altar. And basically saying, God, you're a God who keeps covenant. And you're a God who has a personal relationship with people who serve you. And with that in mind, I'm coming to do the sacrifice. So he says, you're my God. You're, you're the God who keeps covenant with me. So when I talk, you listen. And so to make it even more crazier, he comes to the people and says, guys, let's pour some water on this so that they don't have any kind of doubt. And they pour water, 12 barrels of water. Most people think that they walk down to the, to the sea to bring that water. The sea was very, very far, almost 21 miles away from where they are, and from that mountain. It's really, really far away. They had to climb down the mountain. There's a brook that runs at the end of the mountain, which would still take a lot of time. But they think because there were so many hundreds of people who had gathered, they all must have had water. Everybody must have been carrying water. So everybody had to give all that they had with them to God. At that point, it was a point of no return. Already this God of water didn't show up. Now this is all water we got. Now we're going to have to walk down the mountain, but we're going to have to trust that our God is able to provide, able to do what he said, that when he said he will do it. So they had to lay everything out in front of God and pour out all their water. Can you imagine doing that? Giving everything you have because you trust in God. Because you know, okay, God, I don't have any other choice here. The God I thought was the God of water has not even showed up. These guys were crying, beating themselves, cutting up everything like it didn't show up. So it's you. We use you all we got. You know, that's a very good spot to be in when you don't have any other choice but God. And at that point, how much are you willing to lay down for God? What is the distance that you're willing to go for? And Elijah says, okay, here's what we're going to do. They fill it out. And, they, and the, the Bible says the water ran all around the altar and also filled the trench with water. So it's like it's really watered situation. And they're praying for fire. Like, no, you'd never wet no wood and, and pour water to have fire. Like, you know, you'd use some kind of, like, different gasoline or something extra. Like, not water. Who pours water? Like, Elijah's like, let's just make it clear that our God's going to show up. He's going to, you know, show up. And, and the prayer that Elijah makes is super awesome. In verse 36, and we're wrapping up with this. It came to pass at the time of the offering in the evening, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant, that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that the people may know that you are the Lord God and that you, and that you have turned their backs, hearts back to you again. That's all. That was the end of the prayer. And the Bible says, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice, the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Like everything was gone. It was just a very small prayer. God, if God does, does something, he really doesn't need your help. Elijah builds a trench to hold about 16 pounds of grain. He fills the trench with water and soaks all the wood in water three times. Can you give what is important to God? 
You know, many of us are very, very scared to do different things, especially in a season that we don't know how things are going to go. We're like, yeah, we still don't know where things are going to go. What's going to happen? We're very scared. Would you allow God to use your life? Would you allow God to influence your life and, and do something in and through your life? Would you give what is precious to you to God and trust that precious thing? For us, what is precious is like, it depends on who you talk to, but most people, what's precious is our life. Would you trust your life with God and say, God, this is my life. I'm just giving it to you. During a time when, when we don't know what to really trust or what to really look at, would you trust that a God is a covenant keeper? That he's a promise keeper, that he's a God who's personal? Can you take a chance like Elijah? This altar is an altar of remembrance. Elijah doesn't name it anything, but he just remembers who his God is. God can hear you loud and clear. You don't need to scream. You don't need to shout. You don't need to make any kind of noise. See, when God wants to show up, he don't need anything. He can show up just when you just speak. Elijah doesn't even have like more than two verses of prayer. Just two verses. That's all his is prayer. The most powerful prayer you will see in the Bible. Lord God of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's like, please hear my prayer so that the people will know that I'm doing this because of your word. That's all. And then God shows up. See, for me, you know, I had, as I was writing this sermon, I had asked myself, as a pastor, what would I put out for the vision that God's placed in my life? Everything. Everything. There's nothing that I would think about twice to put on the line for the vision that God's given. There's nothing that I would put on the line that like, I'm like, oh, I can't do that. Nothing, absolutely nothing for reaching this community. What is the one thing that Pastor John, would, you would not do? Absolutely nothing. Everything, I just put everything on the line because I just really believe that my God is a covenant keeper and he's a personal God. He listens to me when I talk to him. I don't have to have the craziest, coolest words, longest sentences. Just simple, God, would you just listen to us? This past week, we prayed for a family. They had a prayer request, and we were praying for them. We went out. Mary and me were there. We were praying for them, and, and we came back. And, and that evening when I was leaving their house, we stood in front of their house and just said a very simple prayer. God, would you just let them know that you care, that your word is true. And they called me the next day and said, Pastor, just like you guys had prayed, God answered the prayer. There was a young man we were praying for last week, right here in our lobby, just struggling with a lot of hurt and pain in his life. When we walked into that prayer, we had no idea how we we're going to pray or what we we're going to say to bring the peace into his life. And, and we sat down there and we just said a very simple prayer. I said, God, would you just give him peace? Because it's not me. I, I can't do nothing. Would you just answer? And God answered, there's nothing that God cannot and will not do for covenant keepers. There's nothing that God will not accomplish for you in your life. Would you stand with me? We're going to pray. I'm going to have the prayer team. I'm just going to have Dave and Miss June and Mary. Come on up over here. We're going to start praying for a couple of people. Thank you, Jesus. Hey, if you're here and you're going through a struggle in and through your life, I want to encourage you. Would you just come on up? We want to pray simple prayers like Elijah prayed and said, God, would you answer? That's all. It's like, I don't care what issue you have in your life. Elijah made a whole altar wet. And he was hoping the fire would show up. Like if he can believe that. And then he prayed like the super shortest prayer. Like I would have been like praying for 10 minutes. Like give me 10. You guys had the whole day. Let me take 10 minutes. Let me talk to God first by myself. Then I'll show up. Like no. Elijah was like no we're doing this right now. Right here. God by the way the people are coming. Just answer the prayer. That's all it is. So I want to challenge you. Would you take a couple minutes. You have a prayer request in your life. Or you're going through any kind of sickness in your life. I want to challenge you. Would you come on up? We're going to pray for you.
Come on up here, Chauncey and Andre. Just come on up. We're going to pray for you guys. Would you take a minute? Just come on up. If there's anything in your life that you're struggling with, and you're like, hey, this is my prayer. This is something I'm struggling with. If you're going through, uh, if, if you're a couple and you want somebody to pray for you as a couple, just come on up here. Dave and June's going to pray for you guys. But if you're a teenager and you want somebody to pray for you, Andre will pray for you guys. Chauncey will pray for you guys. Just come on up just as we're wrapping up. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we just thank you for who you are and what you're doing in and through our life. You're the God who keeps your covenant. You're a personal God. Today, some of us need to revisit altars that are broken in our life. Some of us need to revisit altars that are, that are shattered in our life. We need to revisit who you are in our life. We need to revisit what you are capable of doing in our life. You are an awesome God. You are a great God. Father, we just submit these requests into your hand. If there's anybody in this room who is sick, we just pray that your healing would touch their life. If there's anybody in this room who's struggling with addiction, we just pray that your healing would touch their life. If there's anybody struggling in their marriage, we pray in the name of Jesus that God, you would touch their marriage. If there's anybody in this room praying for any kind of request, Father, we pray the prayer of Elijah. God, would you hear our prayer and answer so that the people know that we are doing this because of your word. Would you answer in the name of Jesus? Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and love of God our Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us both now and forever. Amen. God bless you guys. Hey, as you're leaving, just want to remind you guys, I know some of you ask about the offering. It's the box at the back or you can text it or you can give online. The online thing is super easy. So if you've never done it online, try it. Uh, it's very, very safe. So uh, thank you. Thank you. appreciate you guys. The, the people will be up here for a couple minutes. So if you want to come up and get prayed, uh, feel free to walk up here. They'll pray for you guys. I appreciate you guys. You are a way.